any family camp, and we are restoring it this year. But since it's really difficult to get a place where we could hold the camp, we were able to find one, but we were given a deadline. And so we want everybody to make that decision. The deadline will be next Sunday. So you have the entire week to make that decision. And please uh, go to the Welcome Center. I'm sure there are some informations that uh, you could get. Ruby has emailed something about the family camp. And I trust that you would join us this year. It's going to take place in July. If I'm not mistaken, uh, July 14 to 16? Oh, 12 to 14. 12 to 14. Okay, so please take note. If you have your Bibles with you, John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1 to 15, will be our main text this morning. I'd like to invite everyone to please stand. Let's all read together our main text. John 5, 1 to 15, the healing of the paralyzed man. Let's begin. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In this lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up and while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. At once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it is, un it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, the man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews, that it was Jesus who healed him. May the Lord add blessings, reading of his words. Please be seated. Let me pray. A most gracious, loving Father, once again, we have this opportunity to learn from you. My prayer is that we will be sensitive to the things that you want us to learn. Open our hearts, our minds. Allow the Holy Spirit to be able to deliver with understanding the things that you have prepared for all of us this morning. For this is our prayer in Christ's most wonderful name. Amen and amen. There was a great missionary, Joseph Damien, who ministered to people with leprosy in Molokai, Hawaii. The people to whom he was ministering in the island really grew in their love for him and revered the sacrificial life he was living before them. There was this story one morning as he was preparing for his daily devotions with the people. He was pouring water into a cup that swirled out and suddenly fell on his bare foot. And it took a moment before he realized that he did not feel any sensation on that foot. Now, gripped with fear, he decided he's going to pour more hot water into the same foot. 
And to make the long story short, after he poured a lot of hot water on the same foot, he did not feel anything whatsoever. He immediately realized what had happened, that he had already contracted leprosy. So that morning, as he was about to prepare, or as he was about to give his sermon, he tearfully went before the people. Now, normally, he would address his congregation as my fellow believers, but that morning, it was different. Knowing that he was one of them, he greeted them, my fellow lepers. What a sacrifice. But when you think about it, in a greater measure, that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. He came into this world, sacrificed his own life, so that you and I can receive forgiveness for our sins. I trust that when we look at the sacrifices that you and I are making in order to connect with the Lord Jesus Christ, we would always understand that our sacrifices are nothing to be compared to the sacrifice that Jesus Christ has done for us. But you see, what is sad is that despite all the sacrifices that Jesus Christ has made, there are still many people who have not recognized Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior. John, in John chapter 1, verse 11, said these words. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Jesus Christ became just like us, but despite all the sacrifice, many people have rejected him. You know, when I think about these words, my deepest prayer is that in our regular encounters with you know, one another every Sunday, I, I trust that none of us would fail to recognize Jesus Christ as our own personal Savior. It would be sad wherein you come to Bible Church International they send every Sunday and still go home not recognizing who Jesus Christ is. Now, in the studies that we have started doing, the, the main truth that we would like to literally drive very clearly to each one of us is that we should not have the struggle to see Jesus Christ as the, the Messiah, the Savior that God has promised, because he has given us sufficient signs. In the Gospel of John, we have concrete proofs, evidences, that would help us recognize Jesus Christ as the real Messiah. When we started the series, we looked at the miracle of Jesus Christ turning water into wine. If you were here last Sunday, the second miracle is Jesus Christ healed the nobleman's son. Now, the passage which we have read together would show us the third sign, the third miracle, wherein Jesus Christ would heal a paralytic man. A great story. And I want us to at least highlight four significant elements in this particular story. But please don't forget, these are not just stories thrown in the gospel. They're given to us with a purpose. And notice three or four important truths in this story. Number one, living with hopelessness. You see, as we begin to read the passage, we find the Lord Jesus Christ traveling to Jerusalem to attend a feast. He has regularly done this. Go to Jerusalem to attend the feast. 
It doesn't say what kind of a feast he was going to. Some Bible scholars believe it's the feast of the Passover. And in this feast that he would go to, he decided he's going to have a side trip on the pool of Bethesda. You enter the ship gate. If you go to Israel today, or some of you have been to Israel, you're going to go to the church of St. Anne, a church that has a beautiful acoustic. They were able to discover the pool of Bethesda. And it tells you that the story in the New Testament is true because you have the very place that Jesus Christ went to in the Gospels. But what is important for us to read in verse 3, that in this place, there were multitudes of invalids, according to verse 3. They were the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Now, notice the word invalid in this particular verse is taken from the Greek word astineo, which literally means people without strength. So not just the paralyzed man, but also the blind and the lame. They were literally hanging out around the pool of Bethesda. Why? Because they are after healing. They're looking for God to be gracious to them. Now, that's the reason why when you think about the pool of Bethesda, the place is literally named Bethesda. Why? Because this name or title literally suggests a house of mercy or a house of grace. Now, let me go back to that idea of invalids and Bethesda as a house of mercy and grace. You know that this people who are physically invalid or people without strength literally represent sinners in the New Testament who also are weak and without strength. Listen to this passage in Romans. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. It says here, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. While we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. You see, we said the miracles has a purpose, has a message. Jesus Christ intentionally went to this place where people are physically weak, why? Because he wants to send a message with regards to the spirituality of people who have been devastated by sin. Spiritually speaking, we are weak without strength. Now, one of the hardest things for sinners to acknowledge is that we are helpless and hopeless without Jesus Christ. We are weak. But notice what it says. At the right time, Jesus Christ died for us, for the ungodly, so that you and I can receive the mercy of God. For this invalids, especially the man who has been paralyzed for 38 years. Can you imagine? Now, think about this. Of all the people who were sick that day, why is it that only one man was approached by Jesus Christ? Why didn't he hold a healing crusade that particular morning? He could have healed all of them. But there's a special message that Jesus Christ would like to drive by approaching one man. And 
And the Bible says, if you look at the passage, it says here that Jesus Christ went to him and he has been there for a long time. And if you look at what he said, he said, I've been here, I've been waiting and waiting, but I didn't have my chance. You know why? You see, there's this miraculous event that takes place in the pool of Bethesda. God would send an angel to steer the water of the pool. And the first one who's able to jump gets healed. Now, there were a lot of people there, but only one gets healed every time the water is steered. And for this guy who had been sick for 38 years, he said, I'm helpless, hopeless. Why? Because the water would be steered, and before I could get in, somebody jumps before me. How can I be healed? Can you identify with that feeling of hopelessness missed opportunities for healing for this man who has been invalid for 38 long years. Now, I trust and pray that you and I, as far as our salvation is concerned, would also recognize that hopelessness Without Jesus Christ. Listen to this passage in John chapter 5, 31 to 32. It says, Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You see, people who are Weak, sick because of sin. Should understand the good news that is attached to Jesus Christ. Attached to the work that he did on the cross. Jesus Christ said, I did not come for people who are righteous. But people who are sinners. Jesus came to the world. To give us the spiritual healing we all need. Amen. Aren't you grateful this morning if you know Jesus Christ? That now you're healed because of what he did for us. The second truth is this. The longing for healing. Now, when you jump to verse 6 and 7 the very first thing you would see here is that it says Jesus Christ knew that this man had been lying there for quite some time. Let's stop there. Now, if you're a Bible reader, you should not ignore statements like this about Jesus Christ. Why? Because it talks about Jesus Christ knowing exactly our situations in life. This is one of those statements that prove that Jesus Christ is God, that he is the Son of God. He's not an ordinary person. Because even before he would talk to this man, he already knew that he needed help. He has been longing to be healed. But what is interesting is this. When Jesus Christ approached him, Jesus Christ would ask him, do you want to be healed? Now, isn't it obvious that he wants to be healed? He has been there hoping 
that he will get his chance to be able to jump into the pool, into the pool, but no one was assisting him, right? But Jesus Christ would still ask him, do you want to be healed? Now, there are two reasons why Jesus Christ asked him. First one is this, to expose his dependence. If you go back to the story, instead of simply saying to Jesus Christ when he was asked, do you want to be healed? The paralytic would explain why it was tough for him to be healed. As I have told you, he explained to Jesus Christ that he's not able to jump first into the pool when the water was stirred. So he was giving an excuse for, you know, not being healed. Unfortunately, many people wait until they run out of options before they go to God. People would often say, I have done everything I can. The only thing left to do is pray. Do you sometimes find yourself doing that? Doing everything first. And when you run out of options, time to go to God. I hope I can remind you this morning that God doesn't have to be our last option. He should always be our first. Why? Because He delights in hearing our prayers. Don't ever feel that you are putting so much burden on God's shoulders when you are praying, when you're giving Him your situations, when you are giving Him your needs. No. First John, uh, First Peter 5, 7 clearly says, casting all your anxieties, all your cares on Him because He cares for you. If this is the only message you're here today, I would be satisfied. I could stop here and be happy that I have reminded you that God is never offended when you go to him and trust him for your cares. Why? Because he cares for you. You see, for this man, he understood how dependent he is on God's mercy. He had to explain to Jesus Christ, I have been waiting for my chance to be healed. I'm so dependent at this point in time. Folks, as far as our salvation is concerned, self Help is not going to lead us anywhere. It is only through our dependence on Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ clearly said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. I trust that all of us will recognize this morning if we don't know Jesus Christ yet, stop saving yourself. Go to the true Savior. Once you're saved, I trust that you don't stop going to Jesus Christ because he cares for you. Number two, not only to expose his dependence, but to help express his desire. The truth is, although Jesus knew exactly what he needed, Jesus Christ wanted him to express his desire for healing. Now, this is not the only time Jesus Christ would ask. If you go to Mark chapter 5, verse 51, when he was dealing with the blind man, Bartimaeus, notice what transpired in this story. Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. Now, are you familiar with that story? Jesus Christ was passing by and this blind man started shouting, trying to get the attention of Jesus Christ. Now, he was even scolded by the disciples because he was literally, 
you know, shouting on top of his voice. But Jesus Christ approached him and said, what do you want me to do for you? Almost the same as what Jesus Christ asked the paralytic. Do you want to be healed? What do you want me to do for you? What does God need to do in your life today? Now, the Bible says he's just waiting for you to express. Why? Because by expressing, you're also expressing your need of him. And that you are literally abandoning yourself, but entrusting everything to Jesus Christ. And so once he responds, there's a greater appreciation for the work of God because you know he literally met you according to your needs. Now, look at Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. This is now in terms of salvation. It says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Now, look at this particular passage. It's possible that you get exposed to a preaching like this. And there's this belief that's beginning, you know, to be planted in your heart. It's not enough, according to this verse, to just believe in the heart. What is in your heart, you need to be able to confess to God. Why? Because that confession is an expression of your desire to be saved, right? Because God is not going to force you if you don't want. As far as salvation is concerned, you will have to confess. William MacDonald, a great commentator, said, we are not saved by our own will, yet, the human will must be exercised before God saves us all. That's very true, right? Can you remember the day you humbly come to the Lord and said, Lord, I'm really hopeless. I need you in my life. I'd like to invite you to be my personal Lord and Savior. That's confession, folks. And that's the reason why Jesus Christ asked the paralytic, do you want to be healed? It's just another way of saying, do you want to be saved? What does God want you to do for you this morning? Let him know. Express it from your mouth. Number three, listening to the healer. Now, the third element is found in verses 8 and 9. And this, this is interesting because after this man was told whether or not he wanted to be healed and he gave his excuse, the next words that would come out from the Lord Jesus Christ is this, you know, get up, take up your bed, and walk. Get up, take up your bed, and walk. Now, if you're on the shoes of the paralytic for 38 years, it would not be easy to just get up. Why? Because for sure his muscles had experienced atrophy. The, the muscles are weak. And he probably could have responded to Jesus Christ, are you kidding? You're asking me to get up? But if you watch the, the scriptures, as soon as Jesus Christ said those words, he was healed. He felt that there is this new strength that was coming in in his body. 
And so he decided exactly to obey what Jesus Christ has said, to get up, take his bed, and start walking. Folks, it's important for us to recognize that this is a great story of faith. You know why? Because this man did exactly as Jesus Christ told him to do. Now, last Sunday, if you can still remember, Pastor Jerome talked about the powerful words of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ told the nobleman, go home because your son lives. Remember? And with that proclamation of healing, the nobleman believed him. And when he went home, he was met by the servants. And he asked the servants, what time was the boy healed? And he was told exactly at the time when Jesus Christ said, go home, your son lives. Now, you and I really need to understand how powerful God's word is for our lives. But you see, it's not enough to hear God's word. We need to be able to apply what God has told us in his word. Now, folks, it's significant that you and I who are recipients of God's word on a regular basis should make that decision that if we have heard God tell us something, our response would always be, yes, Lord, I take it at its face value, right? Now, if you remember last Sunday, Brother Irwin was the presider. And during the time of the offering, he stood up and read to us Proverbs chapter 3, 9, and 10. The, the Word of God says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. And if you can remember, Brother Irwin said, in almost all the instructions, the verses that talks about being generous to God, honoring him with your wealth, he said. He, he emphasized that all of these verses would have an attached promise. Just like what you find in verse 10, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Simply, God is saying, I'm going to multiply your blessings if you would honor me with your wealth. Now, the question is, are we going to believe those words? Or just like so many people would find excuses to skip what this verse is saying, to honor God with your wealth. Now, let me ask you, are you a believer of God's word? Or are you someone who continue to find an excuse? And oftentimes, because we always would excuse ourselves, we're the ones being deprived of God's blessings. It's almost like I read this story about a missionary of an inter-varsity Christian fellowship uh, missionary who would have this, his ministry with college students. So he would have several campuses. He would go minister to college students. And at one time, he gathered all the college students and decided they would all attend a weekend conference, which he believed would be a life-changing experience for these college students. And so after the weekend, he gathered the college students for some debriefing to find out what were their blessings, what did they learn. 
And almost every single one of them said, Oh, you should see the notebooks we have filled with the things we have learned. But the intervarsity missionary told them these words. He said, You don't have to show me your notebook. If you have learned anything, I'll see it in your life. Now, same is true. Sometimes we memorize so many verses from the Bible, but the real barometer, whether or not we're really applying God's word, is through our lives. Let me leave you with this truth. You know, when you think about your Bible knowledge, the devil really doesn't care how much knowledge of the Scripture, of the Bible, you know, as long as you don't obey them. True? The devil will not be alarmed, even if you're memorizing verses. As long as you disobey them. The devil will only be alarmed with our Bible knowledge once we begin to live out what we're learning from God's Word. Let me challenge you this morning. God is a God who's able to do impossible things. But in order to see and experience God's miracles, we need to obey Him. We need to believe what He had said in His words. Just like this paralytic, when he was told, get up, take up your bed, walk. Now, if he did not believe Jesus Christ, he could have missed his one-time opportunity to be healed. But praise God, he listened. Let's move to the last. Loving the healer. What ought to be the response when you experience God's miracles? If you would read the story, you first get this negative response from some Jews. When they saw this paralytic carrying his bed, they immediately said, it's Sabbath day. Why are you carrying your bed? You're not allowed to do that. You see, there are some people who are so rigid with rules that they overlook the more important things. Now, yes, it's God who gave the Sabbath law. But if you would study the history of the Jews, they have added so much. Like if you're in Israel today on the Sabbath day, there's an elevator that would automatically stop in every floor. That's just for the Jews because just, you know, pressing the floor for them is not allowed on the Sabbath day. Just pressing first floor. Second floor. That's not allowed. So if there are three elevators, you have to know the elevator that is reserved for the Jew. Or else you're going to stop in every floor on a Sabbath day. And that happened to one of my companions during this recent trip. We were all in the bus already. And one of us was still in the building. And we were all wondering what happened. We had to look for him. He got stuck in the elevator because the elevator was stopping in every floor. And so there are so many additions and that became the traditions for these Jews. But what is sad in this truth is that those people who magnified the Sabbath day missed the opportunity of being drawn to Jesus Christ knowing it was Jesus Christ who provided healing
for this paralytic man, right? But there are two things I really would like to emphasize as far as proper response when you receive God's miracle. Number one is the pursuit of holiness. You see, when the Jews asked the, the, the paralytic, who healed you? He didn't know. Because after he was healed, Jesus Christ withdrew from the crowd. That was not yet the time for him to be acknowledged as the miracle worker, the Messiah. And so he withdrew from the crowd. And later on, the paralytic would meet Jesus Christ in the temple. Now, Bible scholars believe that after the healing, the paralytic went to the temple in order to personally thank God for his healing. And that's where he met Jesus Christ. But what is really important is what Jesus Christ would tell him in verse 12 or in verse 14. Notice, verse 14 says, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. When you have experienced God's miracle in your life, you have some responsibility to love the healer by living a righteous life. Now, with these words, sin no more. Of course, it's impossible for this man to stop sinning and begin living a perfect life. But what you're going to understand at the end of this statement is that his sickness was caused specifically by a sin. And that sin that caused his sickness should be abandoned immediately. That should be the explanation. Now, not all sicknesses are the result of sin, but there are sins that would cause physical diseases. You and the Lord would have, or you, if you're sensitive with the Lord, the Holy Spirit would have a way of letting you know that there's a specific sin in your life that you have to confront and avoid live. And the warning of Jesus Christ for this man is, it's going to be worse for you if you go back to that sin. So folks, we have to constantly evaluate our lives and make sure that we're not repeatedly offending God for specific sins that we allow to reign and rule over our life. If we want to have a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ, we have to deal with sin in our lives. Amen? Now, God knows you'll never be perfect. That's why he said you can always confess your sins and you could be forgiven. But we should not intentionally enjoy sinning. We have the responsibility to pursue holiness as God's people. Number two, not only pursue holiness, but public witness. Go to the last verse because it's significant for us to see in verse 15. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who healed him. When he came to know in the temple that it was Jesus Christ who healed him, Every time he had the opportunity, just like the others whom Jesus Christ had touched, had healed, they shared what Jesus Christ has done for them. I could imagine this man would have the excitement to tell people he met, I'd been a paralytic for 38 years, but now I can walk because Jesus Christ healed me. Folks, I am convinced that God would give us so many opportunities to talk about him, to testify about what he has done for us. The Apostle Paul never missed that opportunity. 
if you would read the book of Acts, some of the letters of the Apostle Paul. In fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, 7, uh, 12 to 17, notice the Apostle Paul saying these words, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. I received mercy for this reason that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example of those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The Apostle Paul never had forgotten his life before he met Jesus Christ, how he was a blasphemer, a persecutor, chief of sinners, according to him. But God allowed him to experience his mercy. Allow me to conclude this sermon this morning, just continually lifting up Jesus Christ to you, allowing you to understand that if you know Jesus Christ today, you have experienced this wonderful gift that you should feel how privileged you are. You know why? Someone had summarized who Jesus Christ is to the believers. And let me just run through what he wrote. For us to have the impression how privileged we are for having Jesus Christ. He said, Christ for sickness, Christ for health, Christ for poverty, Christ for wealth, Christ for joy, Christ for sorrow, Christ today and Christ tomorrow, Christ my life, Christ my light, Christ for morning, noon and night, Christ when all around gives away, Christ my everlasting stay, Christ my rest and Christ my food, Christ above my highest good, Christ my well-beloved friend, Christ my pleasure without end, Christ my Savior, Christ my Lord, Christ my portion, Christ my leader, Christ my peace, Christ has brought my soul's release, Christ my righteousness divine, Christ for me, for he is mine, Christ my wisdom, Christ my need, Christ restores my wandering feet, Christ my advocate and priest, Christ who never forgets the least, Christ my teacher, Christ my guide, Christ my rock, in Christ I hide, Christ the ever-living bread, Christ his precious blood has shed, Christ has brought me nigh to God, Christ the everlasting word, Christ my master, Christ my head, Christ who for my sins has bled, Christ my glory, Christ my crown, Christ the plant of great renown, Christ, my comforter on high. Christ, my hope, draws ever nigh. Jesus Christ is literally our everything. And because of that, He deserves everything from us. Let me pray. Lord, just want to